like me, your game probably has some kind of HUD, some kind of UI element that's always present, but then whenever you end up going into any sort of cutscene, you want that thing to be gone. So we will see here when I enter this very rough, very bad uh, placeholder animation for a cutscene, all of that is gone. And I will also make a skipped cutscene here real quick. Once the cutscene is ended, they're all back. I personally just have my own version of a cutscene actor that is more or less just what the usual sequence player will do for you, but then extended with adding in my own code so that I can start or stop certain behavior whenever a cutscene starts playing. In this case, that would be removing the HUD, but also maybe disabling your player's inputs. Unreal has a bunch of pre-made stuff for disabling player inputs on start and stop of cutscenes, but that can be fairly restrictive as to what that means. Maybe you want to stop certain inputs and not others. Making your own sequence player act up, like we're going to be doing here in a moment, makes it a lot easier to just finally tune what you want to happen when a cutscene starts playing. So we're going to recreate that here in a empty project. First things first, obviously, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new Blueprint class. It's going to be an Actop, and we'll call that BP Cutscene Player, and we'll open that up. Now, just to have it look the same as the default sequence player does, I like to then add in a billboard here, and the billboard is going to obviously uh, then display our level sequence icon. This doesn't really do anything, just makes it easy to find inside of your levels. And that's about everything there is to it. So we don't need a begin play. We don't need a begin overlap. We don't even need a tick. We're going to make all of these just based on custom events and maybe some input stuff. So let's start making a custom event and we'll call that play cutscene. Very first thing that I personally like doing is going ahead and enabling the inputs with enable inputs for this actor. And we'll just get the player controller for that. The reason for that is because we want to be able to potentially handle inputs on this thing for opening up a skip cutscene menu. At the same time, what I want to do is I want to get our player controller and disable the inputs on whatever player pawn we have possessed. So get player pawn. Again, if your game has a more specific function on a specific class, this should be the other way around, for what it means to disable your player's input. Like maybe you wanted to be able to still move around but not attack or something like that. You can just call that function here. That's the upside of making this yourself is the very customizability of what disabling inputs will, will mean to you. Then we create a level sequence player. Now we're going to promote the settings here to a variable and we'll make that instance editable. And the same thing with the actual level sequence. Promote that to a variable as well. This creates a level sequence player that we can first bind to some events that happen when we start and stop it before we actually start playing it. The issue with a lot of the original built-in sequence player is that by the time you have access to it, it likely already has started playing usually, meaning that binding stuff on start play for it uh, you're already too late for that. So what we can do is we can bind events to on play. You can also bind to on pause and on end and whatever you want to do with that, really. And then we can bind events to stop or unfinished. We're just going to go with unfinished. And we'll make those two custom events. Start it playing and a custom event here for finished playing. Once we've bound to those, we can then actually play our sequencer and since we've bound to it before we started playing now it will actually run whatever code we put into here it's also good to keep this thing around uh, as a variable so we'll call this just our uh, sequence player doesn't need to be exposed or anything just easy to get a reference to on a later time now you can actually move this uh, disable input if you wanted to uh, to when it actually starts playing Effectively, this is always the same, right? Because we play cutscene, we create the player, we bind to it, and then we immediately play it. It's just if we, for some reason, then replay this level sequence um, thing, putting your disable input into here means that you get disabled again for your input, whereas leaving it here only disables it on initial play. So it's a little bit better to put it in here. 
my reference project didn't have that, I probably should change that. And in the same way, we can obviously copy our controller and player pawn uh, reference getters here, and then we can enable inputs again. So on our player pawn, that is, we enable our inputs on the player controller. So let's make a super quick uh, just placeholder widgets that we can add just so you can see that it like does something. Uh, so we'll make a user interface, widget blueprints, WBP HUD, make that a canvas panel. And I'm just going to put in a little bit of text centers in the middle of the screen, just so that you can see that it disappears. There's nothing like actually like major going on for this. So in the third person character blueprint, I'll just add that on begin play. Uh, we don't have a begin play yet here. So begin play. Uh, we create a widget that'll be our very ugly HUD and then we'll promote that to a variable as our HUD and add it to the viewport. Now also make a custom event here real quick. You probably maybe want to be doing this with an interface instead in case you have different player character classes that all need to be able to have their HUD hidden. Depends on how you're code is set up in your project obviously we're just going to stick with a simple custom event here and that is uh set hud visibility just going to keep it with set hud vis and we'll get our hud and we'll set the visibility for it and that'll be a input parameter for this and now that we have that we can go back into our cutscene player and we can get our player pawn in this case we do need to cast to our third person character which again that's why you probably want to set up either a very good like class hierarchy for your inheritance, or you want to be able to uh, do this through a interface call instead. But for now, we'll just set HUD uh, visibility. When we start playing, we're going to set this to being hidden. And then when it stops playing, we just kind of do the same thing again. You could save out this reference if you wanted to, but it's not that big a deal to just like cast again real quick to it. And on finish playing, we're going to be setting this to visible or non-hit testable or whatever you need it to be. I'm just going to keep it as visible for now. And that'll allow you to hide your hot widget, whatever it might be, right? Hey, if you're enjoying this content and it's helping you out, please don't forget to leave a like on this video. You can also leave a comment on this video expressing what you liked or asking questions that I can cover in future videos. And then, of course, if you want to stay up to date with those new uploads, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel as well. Now we have this set up. One thing that I personally do like to do is add extra event dispatches onto this actor so that we can easily bind to those whenever it starts and stops playing in case other actors are listening out to this player. So we can just make a on start playing and a on end playing. If you want to, you can add in parameters here, maybe send through a reference to this actor itself if any of your logic needs that. Uh, for now, all that we're going to do is we're just going to add these to uh, call out just so that it's a little bit easier for other things to also bind to this. And now, if we drag this thing into the world just as a sequence player real quick, and you can do this with whatever, I don't know why I have data layers on here, by the way. You can set up the settings for it, whether or not it should autoplay, how it loops, everything that you're used to, as well as what level sequence it should play. Uh, let's just make a super quick level sequence. That's just a couple of camera movements. Uh, tutorial scene. We'll just very quickly add a camera and then position it over here. Takes two seconds. Moves like this. Another keyframe. There we go, right? It's a super simple quote unquote cutscene that just takes two seconds to move from position A to position B. In the level sequence, we'll put in that thing. And then I'll just add in a trigger volume like a trigger box that we put over here. So if we walk off this side, it will start triggering that thing. I uh, will do that in the level blueprint. As long as we have this thing selected in the level blueprint, we can add an event, collision, begin overlap. And we can just check if the other actor is the get player pawn. And if that ends up being true, what we can do is we get our reference to this. Again, create it in our level blueprints and then we can play our cutscene and you will see that this effectively uh, does everything we want so we have our text block if i walk to the left here place the cutscene text block is gone and text block will be back when the cutscene is over so that's uh, pretty much everything there is to it i did also have the end cutscene or skip cutscene thing in my preview there 
I'm not going to reconstruct that step by step, uh, but I'll just walk you through my own project real quick as to how that works so that you have a general overview. Because the way that that works is because I enable my input here, I can just put in an input action from the enhanced input system and it will work and respond to my input triggers. Then I uh, cast to my player character and I'm using common UI. So instead of making a new UI widget, I push to an active widget stack and we're just pushing uh, this skip cutscene widget that I have here, which just has a continue button, which once again removes this thing from the screen and just keeps on playing and the skip cutscene button which what that does is when it is clicked is skip cutscene it just calls out a event dispatcher for skip scene and as you can see uh continue just both of them set the game to unpaused game pauses whenever this thing is constructed it unbinds everything from skip cutscene because the thing is not going to be on screen anymore so we don't need that binding we set the input mode back to game only, and then I deactivate this widget. I think actually we can get rid of remove from parents. That's from the old system before I was using common UI. Uh, but the most important thing is that I, on this thing, have a event dispatcher that calls out whenever I press that skip cutscene button. In our cutscene actor then, whenever we have added this to the screen, if you just use create widgets, you get that return value of the widget that you just created. Uh, with common UI, I need to then get the new, like, active widget from our stack but either way what you want to do is you just want to get a reference to the widget you just made and then you can bind to that skip cutscene thing and all that you need to do there is it's called new var here because i'm bad uh, but that's our level sequence player that we make somewhere up here as you can see create level sequence player get set to a new var uh, that just has a build-on thing for go to end and stop uh, in my case what i do i think is i uh, bind my and cutscene to stop, not to unfinished. Uh, because if you want to be able to skip it, unfinished only runs when it actually finishes. On stop also runs when it either just naturally finishes or when it is forcefully stopped. All that as just a general overview, because it's something that I showed off. It's not really what this video is about, but otherwise I might leave you hanging as to how that roughly works. And a very big thank you to all my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help support the channel or get any of the project files in any of my tutorials, there's a link down below to the Patreon page to support me or alternatively as a YouTube member. My cave student tier supporters, Oiku, Earl, Monsville, Erno, and my cave digger tier supporters, Mauricio Perias.